We often think how winglets affect the flow near the wingtip, and it makes sense because that's where we put winglets. We locate them there, and they are also there to affect the flow around the wingtip. They are there to stop that vortex from happening, this wingtip vortex. And if you don't know what winglets are, they are those vertical end plates at the end of most passenger airplanes. And we've done several podcasts on them and different designs, but we have never covered the fact that winglets actually affect the flow over the entire wing, not just near the wing tip, but also the like mid span and also near the wing root. Literally, even there, um, you get the different types of winglets affecting the flow. And today we're going to look at why and how. And we will look at four different winglet designs to see if each one changes the flow over the wing. And to do so, we're looking at a paper called, let me scroll up here, uh, Numerical Study of Secondary Flow Characteristics on the Use of the Winglets. It is open access, so you can find it in the link below. And this is a CFD study, and there are some good things about this CFD study, and there are some bad things, which we'll cover both of them later on. But let's first jump into what they did. So in figure two, they have four different wingtip designs that they looked at. These four designs are in addition to the regular wing, which has no wingtip, so it's just like the flat regular plane. And they have, first of all, the simple winglet where it is just vertically up. This is pretty similar to what you find on a lot of passenger airplanes, for example, like a Boeing 737. The Boeing 737 is usually a little bit more blended, but generally speaking, it's just this vertical upright plane. Then they have a very similar one, but instead of the winglet just poking up straight up, it's blended, so it curves near the intersection between the actual wing platform and the winglet. And then it sort of blends finally going up, but not completely vertically up, but more like at an angle. Then they have something called a forward wingtip fence, and this is akin to an Airbus's sharklet. So if you look at like an Airbus compared to like an Airbus A320 compared to a seven, uh, Boeing 737, the winglets are quite different, like the Boeing ones, they come up and down like a like a triangle on the winglet, whereas the um, Boeing ones are really just this bit coming up. And for this uh, forward wingtip fence, the triangle plate starts at the very lead start of leading edge. That's important because they do have another wingtip that they're looking at, this wingtip fence, which is called a rearward wingtip fence. And this is very similar to the forward wingtip fence, except it starts from the mid cord. So it's again, this, this triangular, like slap on thing to the end of the wingtip. But instead of starting at the leading edge, it's at about mid span. And secondly, this one is actually much thinner of a triangle because even though it starts at the mid span, it terminates at the trailing edge, whereas the forward wingtip fence starts at the leading edge and goes all the way to the uh, trailing edge. So that's the entire cord. So one thing that really stands out in this study is just how low a Reynolds number they're looking at here. They're looking at 23,400, and this is really low. So at this Reynolds number, something unique uh, some unique things do happen. So the flow will almost certainly be laminar. And I would say that, that this is a good bet here in their CFD because the turbulence intensity is only 0.8%. At this turbulence intensity level and this Reynolds number, there is little reason to think that the flow will be uh, turbulent or even transition. So because of that, they have a big advantage, not only that they don't have to worry about laminar separation bubbles. And the reason I say that is because from experience, these things can really mess up your CFD and it like takes a lot of work just to get the CFD accurate. And so if you don't, if you have a situation where the flow is completely laminar or completely turbulent, then you should count your lucky stars as they have here. They don't need to worry about this additional problem. Now to look into how the winglets affect the flow over the wing in general, they looked at an Epler 562 airfoil, which is a highly cambered airfoil, 4% uh, camber and very thick, 15% thickness of the thickness to quality ratio. And at this Reynolds number, the maximum lift coefficient is about 0.75 and the minimum drag coefficient is about 0.037, which is a little high. And this is what's been documented in um, literature. And one thing to note for this airfoil is that around this Reynolds number, the stall occurs at about nine degrees at about 23,400, 50,000 Reynolds number around this sort of range. That's when stall starts to occur. So these people uh, are doing the CFD for 12 degree and 15 degree angles of attack, which is into the stall range. Uh, and it's a little odd that they would choose this angle of attack or these angles because unless you're looking at safety of the wings and how to recover from stall, it isn't really the typical angles that you would look at. Like most airplanes will be cruising at about two to three degrees. And okay, during takeoff, they might go much higher, but then they do have like wing, um, like trailing edge flaps and Kruger flaps, etc. cetera. Um, these ones don't, they're very simple wings. So to be at such a high angle of attack, I'm not sure what application that is, but as we will see, there is still some attached flow at these angles of attack. So they don't give many pictures of their CFD setup or mesh, just one about the general domain. 
And this is a rectangular prism, as we can see in figure three. Assuming that this picture is to scale, they definitely have quite a large downstream region. And that's good, like you're, you're putting the um, exit of the CFD domain quite far away from the wing, so like the trailing edge. So the flow can um, evolve at how it wants to and it's not being uh, affected by the outlet. Now, in contrast, the wing is only about five chords from the bottom and five, five chords from the top. And if uh, the wing were to producing a lot of lift, this might be a little too close because the flow directed down from the wing might be impacted by the boundaries. But because this airfoil is likely going to uh, be having a bit of stall, and with a little research before this, you could tell that um, having the bottom this close isn't that big a deal because the flow won't be directed down as much. So if you have like this airfoil at, let's say, nine degrees or eight degrees, where the flow is completely attached, and the flow is gonna be coming down at a much greater angle because of that complete flow attachment. This is going to be a little bit in the stall regime, so the flow is not going to be at an angle down as much. It's not going to hit this um, bottom wall nearly as much, at least it probably shouldn't. So the chances of the boundary influencing the wake is quite low here. And they give some other CFD uh, details as well. So for example, they tried really hard to get their Y plus around one, which is really ironic and impressive because they're trying so hard here, which is great. But compared to many other studies that look at high Reynolds numbers, uh, particularly around transition, it isn't as important here to get a Y plus of one. And the ironic part is that many of those studies that look in the transitional regime don't look don't have a Y plus of one when they should be having Y plus of one. So when it really matters, they don't have it. But these researchers, when it doesn't really matter as much, do have it. So they've gone to a really long length here to get it. So that's quite funny. And one reason why they really wanted to get a Y plus of one uh, is that they used a the K-Omega SSD Terminus model, which I think is a good choice. And this Terminus model, um, like you should really have a Y plus value of below five and one is ideal. Um, so that's why they went to this such a length. Now, they did do a grid independent study, but I think that it's a bit dodgy. So while they did the Y plus really well, the grid independent study is not so good. So Actually, I guess I shouldn't say that. I mean, it really depends on how accurate you want the CFD and what you want to do the CFD and what you, what you want it for. In this case, I think the CFD is only really good for the general trends. And let's look at why that is. So with the grid independent study, we can see that in table one, they looked at four different grid finenesses. This was for the, rec the regular wing without any winglets, by the way. And the mesh ranged from 353,000 cells to 768,000 cells. And they had two other levels between these two values. And they only looked at the drag coefficient, as they, at least that's what they say here, which I don't quite understand. I mean, the lift coefficient is also very important, but we don't have that reported here. But anyway, if you look at the mesh independent study, the drag coefficient between the two finest meshes are within about 2% uh, of each other. So these two here, that is pretty good. But the thing is that the finest mesh is only about 35% finer, so 35% more cells than the second finest mesh. So you can see the second finest mesh here is about 570,000 cells. The finest one is 770,000 cells. So that isn't quite enough to conclude that the mesh has converged because we don't have nearly as big a jump in these two finenesses as what we really should. It's only a 30% increase. And we cover this and what you need to do in an accurate mesh independent study in our intermediate CFD course, if you're interested. Uh, so I think that this mesh independent study isn't that good. It's okay, but not great, which is one major reason why I say that this CFD is really only good enough to show us the general trends. It's not uh, good enough to look at the forces. In addition to that, there is no actual validation of this data, of the, of the CFD data. And there is no comparison between these results to any experimental results or real world results or even other CFD results. So that is a major flaw in this work. So overall, I think that we can only really use a CFD to get some general trends of what's happening. One other thing is that it is interesting that the drag coefficient is so high to me, like it's 0 0.9, which is really high. So that makes me think two things. The first is that either this wing has been dramatically stalled, and I mean big time, like a lot of flow has completely stalled from like the leading edge. So there's a really high drag coefficient here, or when they write the drag coefficient here, they actually mean the lift coefficient. And I actually think that it's uh, more likely to be that this is actually the lift coefficient and they write, not the drag coefficient. 
um, because when we go through more results, so like figure five, which we'll see a bit later on, uh, we'll see that much of the flow is still attached over the wing. So I don't think that the wing has undergone dramatic stall yet. So that doesn't justify having such a big drag coefficient. So I think this number here, like a 0 0.9 value is about the lift coefficient, which sort of kind of corresponds to what lift coefficient you'd have at this angle of attack anyway. Hence why I think that these drag coefficients are actually the lift coefficient values. And this is just a typo, I think, that they repeat a few times. So if so, then the results in table one make a lot more sense because at these general conditions, the lift coefficient of this Epler 562 wing should be producing about this much lift. Anyway, one other thing that I think is interesting is that there is the number of inflation layers that they use in their mesh. So if you don't know what an inflation layer is, it's um, when you have an object in the flow in your CFD setup, you want to uh, resolve the boundary layer quite well. And if you have quite a coarse mesh, like um, in terms of height wise going from the surface upwards, if you have a fairly coarse mesh, then you're not going to be picking up all this turbulence that's happening. And okay, this is a KMEG SST, this is a, a RANS or URANS simulation, but still that is important to resolve the boundary layer. And by having a finer mesh as we go up, that helps you do that. That's called an inflation layer or a boundary layer mesh. So having an inflation layer of 40, that means that there are 40 layers going up. And then I'm assuming that each layer gets um, a bit coarse as you go up, which is usually how you do it, but they don't say too much here about it. So having 40 is quite a lot, particularly for such a simple wing, that doesn't hurt uh, usually, but it really seems like they put a huge amount of effort into making the boundary layer mesh good. Um, so there is definitely some potential to make the CFD better considering that they have really good, a really good foundation for the boundary layer mesh already. And then a little bit more work would have made this research a lot better. For example, if they um, had some validation data or they made their mesh independent study a bit better, that would have really catapulted their CFD into being a lot better quality. As it stands, I would give the CFD around a five out of 10. It's good enough for just the general trends, but not much more. So let's move on to the results. So in figure four, let me scroll down to that one. We see the pressure plots directly behind the different wings trailing edges at an angle attack of 12 degrees. So for figure four A, they have what is, is down here, which is the typical wing without any winglets. We get a very familiar plot on the lower half of the plot. So underneath here, the pressure is high, which corresponds to the pressure of the air on the bottom surface of the wing. On the top of, of the pot, plot, we see high pressure, which corresponds to the pressure on of the air on the upper surface of the wing, the suction side. Now at the wing tip, we see a low pressure core. That is because of the wing tip vortex, and that makes a lot of sense. Now let's move on to the different winglet designs to see how they affected the pressures, particularly around the wing tip. So in figure 4B, uh, that is for the wing with a simple winglet. So let me go to figure 2A just to jog your memory. This is this winglet here, which is just the wing with the winglet pointing straight up. So this is pretty funny because yes, the winglet definitely reduces how big the low pressure core uh, from the wing vortex is. There is, but there is still one here and now it exists where the tip of the winglet is. <laughs> so <laughs> literally a new vortex is forming but now at the winglet's wingtip instead of the wing's wingtip so you've gotten rid of the wing's wingtip by putting this winglet on here but now the vortex insists on forming at the winglet's wingtip so that makes a lot of sense because this is where the air from underneath can now roll up that's the, this is the first point at which it can access the suction side and one thing i should mention about these graphs is that the color bar used is not that great so this color bar has 12 different colors in it which means that it's very discontinuous if you look at it here. Literally every color represents five pascals. What that means is that the pressures aren't accurately represented. So let me give you an example of what I mean to show you. Okay, so if you have a pressure that is 0.1 pascals and another one that is 4.9 pascals, you can see that they will both be represented by the same color. It's like this green here. So a 4.8% pascal change doesn't show up in these plots because it's all the exact same color. But if you now had one pressure at 4.9 pascals and another at 5.1 pascals, those two different pressures, despite only being 0.2 pascals difference, will have different colors and you can tell. So 4.9 is right here, 5.1 is here. It's a significantly different green color. So on the one hand, a 4.8 pascal change didn't show up. And on the other hand, a 0.2 pascal change did show up. That means that some changes that really are there can't be found. And some things that aren't there um, seem to be there because of this color bar that, that is discontinuous, discontinuous, sorry. Uh, 
this color bar should have been much finer, maybe like having 200 different colors. So that way you can like differentiate the pressures a lot better. Uh, that is a lesson. If you were ever doing plots like this, you'd have a very fine color bar. Otherwise, uh, some of the conclusions drawn here uh, are not exactly true. And other ones that should be drawn can't be drawn because we don't have the visual information here. So really the only time you wouldn't want to have a fine color bar is when you have a specific thing to show and you want to highlight it. So for example, say the point at which the flow changes from negative pressure to positive pressure, that might be really important to you. So as a result, you would say, okay, at this zero uh, Pascal value, I'm going to make this the discontinuous point where below this, it could be blue. Above that, it could be red. As a result, it's really easy to see where this change occurs. As it stands, we are not really interested in that too much. We want to see more just the general pressures. So this color bar should be more uh, continuous than this. Anyway, let's move on to the other wings. So the blended wing has a very similar uh, pressure distribution to the regular winglet wing around the wing tip. So this is the simple wing with the regular simple winglet. This is the blended winglet down here. And there's a low pressure core. And that is almost certainly because of the wingtip vortex now forming on the top of the winglet, so just here. However, it has a higher pressure indicating a weaker vortex. Now, that may not necessarily be the case, but um, we would have to calculate the circulation, um, but is probably the case from what we can see from this pressure plot. Now, in figures 4D and E, we see the two wingtip fences, and this is pretty cool because the one where the fence starts at the leading edge and the one that starts from the mid chord respectively. And with both of these, we can see that there is still a wingtip vortex forming. And again, it's on the inside of the top part of the winglet. So these wingtip for, uh, these winglets are not preventing the wingtip vortex from really forming. It's just changing really how strong it is and where it appears. So I'm a little surprised, I guess, to some extent, because uh, you literally have two barriers blocking the high pressure flow from the low pressure flow. But still, for this wing at this high angle attack, um, the high pressure air seems to still bleed around and at the very least pushes other air over the top of the winglet to uh, create this vortex. Now, the rear wood uh, wingtip fence, which is this uh, lower figure here, the one that starts from like halfway down the wing cord and then goes to the the trailing edge has a larger low pressure core than the uh, wingtip fence that starts at the leading edge, but the minimum pressure is higher for the rear wood fence. So you can see it's a lighter blue than here. So one thing I should mention is that having such a low pressure core near the suction surface of the wing help, will help with the local lift production there in terms of the pressure. But it also depends on the vortex and where it's located. So because this vortex spins uh, in such a way that it will usually force air down onto the wing, that reduces the effective angle attack of the air in this region. As a result, uh, the the lift produced in this region will reduce because of this low pressure, this um, the air being forced down and reducing the effective angle attack. But on the other hand, you have this low pressure core, which could very well increase the lift. But on the other hand, you have the vortex pushing the flow down, which then reduces the lift. So. Uh, they may cancel out or one may override the other, depending on the situation. Generally speaking, uh, it reduces lift in this region because the flow is being pushed down a lot more, reducing the effective angle attack. And one thing that would be good is if you could somehow move the vortex away from the winglet so that it is completely over the wing. That way, yes, one side of the vortex will be pushing flow down. The other one will be upwashing the flow. And hopefully these would cancel each other out and the lift will be unaffected by the upwash and downwash. Then the low pressure core can do its thing and increase the lift. That is just one idea for these winglets. And like here, they are not eliminating the vortices. So maybe relocating where the vortex occurs would be an option. Anyway, let's move on to the effects of the winglet over, of the effects that the winglet has or the flow over the entire suction surface of the wings. Because we've looked at the winglets in this wingtip region. What about the rest of the wing though? So in figure five, we see the pressure contours, which are colored in like this blue color. They're pretty much all blue. There's no green or anything. So maybe this color bar should have been shrunk a little bit. Anyway, uh, we see the pressure contours on the upper surface of the wing, of the wing, sorry, which is the suction surface here. And this is an angle type of 15 degrees, whereas the last one was 12 degrees. So the figures also show the paths uh, the flow takes on the surface. Now, I don't know if these are instantaneous or not, because I don't know if the CFD is steady state or transient. There is no information about the time step. I'm pretty sure it's RANDs, uh, but I'm not completely sure. But anyway, I think the general trends are fine. 
So for the plane wing, which is figure 5a, we see a few things. The first is that some of the upper surface is installed. So you can see at the trailing edge here, they, there are these regions that don't have any of the streamlines that are coming from a leading edge. That indicates that none of the flow from the leading edge is making it into these regions. Like, let me zoom in a little bit actually, so we can see a bit better. So like this region here, or if we scroll across this region here, this region here, there are no streamlines going from the leading edge to these regions. So this indicates that these regions are installed because there's no flow coming from the leading edge into these regions. The flow is coming from elsewhere. So this stool pattern is quite interesting. It isn't just a line going across the rear part of the upper surface, but rather there are these like little pockets of separated flow. This might be because this one is a snapshot in time and not the average flow, but I'm not sure. Anyway, another interesting thing to note is that the near near the wingtip, sorry, the wingtip vortex is definitely affecting the flow over the suction surface. So inside this red box, we see a very high concentration of streamlines. They swell around here and much more of the flow near the wingtip has separated. So you can see where this, let me zoom in here, you can see how much more of the wing has separated. So like a third of the wing compared to a quarter. Now, if you look at the surface streamlines as we go across the wing, the wing, so look at these streamlines here, we see that they are generally angled towards the wing root. So they're coming in a little bit. They're usually coming this way. So to the left side of the page, is that normal? Well, yes. In fact, this is something that isn't really talked about that much. Like the wingtip vortex gets so much more attention, but the way the flow goes over the wing and under a wing is really important and very interesting as well, because it tells us how really these vortices do form to begin with. So let me go into paint here and I can show you what happens. So we have, I drew, drew this earlier. I, it's a work of art, I know. <laughs> no, no need to comment. <laughs> anyway, we have this wing that I drew earlier in the black and we have the wing root here that I've just drawn as like a, a, a wall. And we have the suction surface on top. So we're looking down on the wing. Now we know that the suction surface has a low pressure uh, flow over it and the pressure surface which is the undersurface has a higher pressure we know that high pressure flow loves to flow to the low pressure flow it's like when people line up to get a new iphone for example they can't help themselves they just have to go there it's the same thing with this high pressure flow it has to go to low pressure now that means that the flow underneath moves out a little so this these blue lines that's the flow underneath and you can see i've dashed them to make sure that like it looks like it's going underneath they swing out to the wingtip as they flow along in other words, the flow under the wing does not travel in a straight line from the leading edge to the trailing edge. In fact, it curves towards the wing tip a little as it goes along. Now, that is the pressure side. What about the suction side, the upper side? Well, we have the flow coming from around the wing tip and taking up space here. So the flow comes around and takes up space around here. So you have more or less the same amount of flow traveling over the suction surface, but there is now a little bit of the wing occupied with this wing tip vortex. As such, the flow over the wing, over the suction surface, sorry, curves towards the wing root. And that is exactly what we see here in figure 5a. We see them swing towards the wing root. And it is amazing how sensitive uh, the air is to pressure changes. So, I mean, we see it here when the flow over the entire wing now gets curved a little, but we also see it in real life. So to give you an example of a real life situation, have you ever been in a big room, for example? It doesn't even need to be a small room, even a big room, a warehouse. So there's a door on each side, uh, one, let's say, all the way down on one side and you're near the door on another side. And let's say the door on the other end is open a little. And then you either slam your door shut or open it really quickly. And then the door all the way on the other side of the room moves, whether that is it slams shut as well or opens quite quickly. That is all because of pressure differences. The door can be 20 meters away or even more, and it is affected almost instantaneously. The same kind of thing is happening here. A pressure difference is causing the flow on top to bend towards the wing root. And that is because of the flow bleeding over from the pressure side to the suction side. So from that logic, it stands to reason that the more the flow on, this is kind of a general idea. I'll explain it and then talk about some caveats. So it stands to reason that the flow on top curves towards the wing root, the more the air is bleeding around, which is also related to the wingtip vortex and its strength. So if we see a significant reduction in the amount of curvature, then we could be fairly confident that the wingtip vortex is weaker with everything else being constant. Now, of course, if the wingtip vortex were to be farther away from the wing's upper surface, a similar effect would occur. And that's where this general idea breaks down. But that is why we can only be fairly confident and not completely confident when we see the lines not curving as much. 
And the reason why I bring this up, this idea is because when we look at wings and winglets of various designs, we do see that the streamlines on top don't curve nearly as much towards the wing root as the streamlines with the wing without winglets. So that could either be because the wingtip vortex is weaker or because it has moved farther away from the upper surface as we know it can from figure four. So we see in figure four, this vortex for the plane wing is very close to the winglet, to the, sorry, to the wingtip without a winglet and the wing itself. As you put winglets on here, the vortex moves farther and farther away and also probably changes the wingtip vortex strength. It's, it's very likely. So it could be that the vortex is getting weaker, it's moving further away, or both. The vortex is weaker and moving further away. So strangely, the wing with the rearward wingtip fence, so if we come down here, this one here, um, strangely, the one that starts from the about the mid-chord and has almost no stall going on here, so this winglet, for some reason, has affected the stall pattern dramatically, and I'm, I'm not sure why. I mean, every other wing has quite a lot of stall going on. You can see there's some stall here, some stall here, some stall here for other the other winglets, but the flow over this wing remains pretty much attached until the trailing edge, and I don't know why, I don't understand why. Um, I don't know why I have such a great effect. I just wonder if it was a different instant in time or maybe a CFD error. And that brings up a good point. So because these are streamlines, I don't know if this CFD is transient or steady state. I can't tell whether the differences in these figures stall patterns are simply because they're instantaneous snapshots of what's going on or averages. So I don't think we can rely on the stall patterns that much, but the differences in the stream surface streamlines curvatures definitely make sense. So we see that if we put these winglets on, the streamlines are sort of straightening up a lot more. They're not curving towards the wing root with any of these winglets. So that's that makes sense. So I think this general trend where the winglets reduce the streamlines curvatures hold true. And that brings us to the end of the podcast where we see how these winglets really affect the flow over the rest of the wing, not just near the wing tip, but also the rest of the wing. And if you like this podcast, make sure to hit the like button and the subscribe or follow button, whichever platform you're on. And if you want to get better at CFD or learn how to use OpenFoam, and if you don't know what OpenFoam is, it's a completely free software and a very capable CFD software. It's like really, really good. Uh, so you can take the course that we put on to teach you how to use OpenFoam, completely free, uh, a completely free software. Our course is in the link below. And if you want to make your experiments two to four percent more accurate, get yourself an Atmosphere Hawk. It's an instrument that we make to make your experiments that much more accurate. And if you don't know why that is the case, why your experiments have two to four percent accurate to 4% error in your uh, data. We explain it on its page, which you can find in the link below. And that is it. I'll see you next podcast. Peace out, amigos.